All right, all right. What's going on, everybody? It's Dolo Ren, co-producer of the Productive Conversations podcast. Now, we're not going to have Matt on here today, and this is going to be an audio exclusive. So you'll, you're going to see some clips on the YouTube, on the Instagram, on the TikTok, on the Facebook, on the Twitter. But you won't see an official video episode for this. This is the UFC 288 post reaction by yours truly, Dolo Ren, the top MMA analyst in the world. Maybe not the world, but soon. Maybe, maybe of my section of where I live, but either way, we're getting there. And it's an honor, once again, to be able to show Furtis, you know, new show into the whole curriculum. So shout out to the NBA show, shout out to the NBA crew, shout out to the football crew, NFL crew, shout out to the college ball crew, and shout out to the wrestling guys, and everybody else has been on the show. So, boom, got my shout outs out the way. Now let's get to it, let's get to it. We're a little bit off timing with this, and that's kind of my fault, but we're going to get straight into it, of the top three fights that... Your boy predicted himself. And just want to add in there before we get started. I told y'all so. What I tell y'all, I told y'all that, you know, Cejudo is underestimating Sterling. I told you Sterling was a little bit too long, a little bit too rangy. And we saw the results of that. And, you know, it's okay. It's okay if you doubted me. But for those YouTube commenters, for the TikTok commenters, for the Instagram commenters that were coming at my top saying I didn't know MMA, I just want to know, how do you feel now? Now that you've seen all my predictions go the right way for me. I'll wait. And you can always contact me. It's Dolo Ren on Instagram, Dolo Ren on Twitter, Dolo Ren on, uh, on TikTok. I don't really use TikTok, but either way. Holla at me, man. Let's talk. You know, I'm always, even if I'm wrong, even if my predictions are wrong, always come, I'm always coming willing to talk. And it is what it is. Which is why, you know, you should step up to the play. I'm calling you out right now. But either way, let's get, let's get into it, man. We only covered the three top fights at, at a card. You know, we want to start off light and be able to give as much of an analysis in depth as possible so if we laser focus on the big fights first you, you know we can further on down the road go into undercard fighters more often but let's get into it for the main event we had Henry Cejudo Aljamain Sterling in New Jersey now in the show I didn't really realize why the event was in it was in New Jersey but now I understand that Sterling's hometown, I, I believe he's from New York, but but New Jersey is still his background, you know, his backyard, which kind of sucks that when he won the fight, they were kind of booing him. It seems like people kind of came out to see Henry Cejudo, and that kind of sucks because, you know, that's, that's your man. That's your man. You should be elevating your mans and, you know, trying to put him on that pedestal. You, you know, he's from the he, he's from the background, you know, from the backyard. He's from the East Coast. Got to support your mans more. We got to do better. East Coast, we got to do better. Regardless, Aljamain Sterling, Henry Cejudo, goes all five rounds. Split decision. Now, the judging criteria we'll get into, into in a second, but I just want to say it was, a, it was a good fight. It was a back-and-forth fight. You know, it. each fighter had their moments, and Sterling was really... He really came and he used that range really well. He was really using that, that range well. He kept on the pressure. Like I said, he was bigger and stronger in height and reach. He mixed the striking well with the takedowns. And, you know, he had pretty good ground ground control when he had it. In this fight, it was it was more so his striking that got him his success, which is a pretty cool thing to see. You know, a 
lot of people were underestimating Sterling striking because of the Peter Yan fight. And I think that, I, I thought just off rip, that was a huge mistake. Because he's always been, you know, he's always had a variety of strikes that he's been able to throw in there. Um, like that Super Mario knee that he throws straight into an opponent's chin, which is a pretty dope knee. One of my favorite knees in MMA. It, it, it's pretty cool how he just bounces up and boom, plants, plants it right under the chin. And in this fight, he was using his elbows, you know, he's was, he was using his knees. You know, there was an exchange, I forgot, maybe in the second or third round. Or maybe the first, I'm not sure, at, at one point. But it was it was a point where he kind of had Henry uh, uh, against the cage. And he need his calf. He need him in the calf. And, and hit him with a left cross, with a southpaw cross. And then, boom, the, the round ended and... Man, you could you could see the damage already on on Henry's face at that point. So it was pretty crazy to see that. You know, he's he's going in, man. He was going in. But uh Yeah, it just seemed like he outclassed him on the striking. Even though Cejudo was catching up in the fifth round with the striking, he, he's you know, when he when when he has a when he has an opponent figured out, when he's had some time to deal with them, he's really able to throw those punches really calculated, get you know, once he figures out that distance and range, Henry Cejudo is a dangerous man. But uh, it was just the height too. You know, the height was was one thing for Henry too. He's you know he's shorter. He's a lot shorter, and Aljamain maybe not a lot shorter, but shorter enough to where it was harder to land certain strikes on Aljamain. But all credit to Henry for coming back from three years in a retirement and even looking competitive. You know, even the rounds that went to Sterling were still pretty competitive. And the fifth round, yeah, Cejudo was putting he Cejudo was putting it on him in that fifth round. I'm not gonna hold you, not gonna hold you there. But uh, you know, Cejudo showed that he had you know that he still had his wrestling pedigree in check. Aljamain was able to to negate that wrestling as well, so. It was cool to see the new school versus sort of the old school in a sense where you got a guy that's a champ now versus a guy that used to be a champ. And to see the wrestling, you know, has has evolved with the sport is, is a pretty cool thing to see. And that's what Cejudo said surprised him was how good uh, Sterling's wrestling was able to negate his. So, you know, kudos to Sterling on the wrestling, especially from a from a gold medalist. That's a good kudos right there. Hell yeah. Now, the thing about the fifth round, Henry Cejudo has that vet experience where when you're a champion, you know that if you leave it in the judges' hands, you got to leave a good last impression on the judges. In fights, it's a little different than in real life. You know, in, in real life, you want to have a good first impression. In a fight, especially a championship fight with the title on the line, you want to have a good last impression. You want the judges to see the last few moments of action where you were in control and where you were directing the fight and you were on top and winning the exchanges. So I believe Henry Cejudo was kind of counting on that as a vet to just give a really good fifth round. It just didn't work out in his favor um, as far as the scorecards. And whatever that judge's name is, I, I should have figured it out before I got on, on the mic. But that judge that got that fifth round for Sterling is terrible. You know, all the other rounds, it's like, you know, give and take. You know, each judge had, you know, certain things going on. But for the most part, it was, it was just... How could you how could you give Sterling that last round? That's just ridiculous. You know people like that, we have to know their names. And I encourage anyone listening to, you know, keep tabs on these type of judges cuz you know, these are the type of judges that ruin sports, that ruin decisions, that ruin good victories. Can't have that going on. But even though the judging was a little bit wonky, uh we had the correct result. We had the correct result. So that's what matters. Sterling was just too young, too fresh. 
He's good, well-rounded everywhere. Was able to keep up. Was using his reach, his height, and was able to give it to Henry Cejudo. Well done. And that's one that's one fight check marked on my parlay. Now, obviously, we're going in opposite order because normally it'd be this fight last on the parlay. But either way, we're already talking about a victory, so I guess it doesn't matter in what order you won at this point. It just matters that the predictions were right. Now, mind you, like I said, it doesn't matter even if you get some predictions wrong. It doesn't matter. You know, you can still be a student of the sport, and sometimes you get it wrong. But it's, it's cool to have that banter, so feel free to comment. Feel free to leave comments. Feel free to, you know, like and subscribe to everything we got going on at Productive Conversations Podcast. You will see more MMA news soon. And maybe this won't always be the format that we do it in, but regardless, we're going in opposite order today. So just wanted to get that out the way. So, boom. Uh... As far as what's next, I believe Sterling and O'Malley is next. You know, after he comes in, after he ran into the octagon, and you know started wanted to face him down and start talking his talk. You know, with Marab right there. You know, him ranked to number one, and Sean O'Malley, I believe, ranked to number two or three, maybe two. Either way, Marab is ranked over uh, Sean O'Malley. But um, since Marab and Aljamain Sterling are friends, Marab has told Dana White that he doesn't want to fight Aljamain. But that doesn't really leave, you know, much for the rest of us. But in turn, I, I guess maybe I'm talking in circles at this point, but this did leave us, regardless of the situation and why Marab doesn't want to fight Sterling, we have a good fight right now with Sterling and O'Malley. That's going to be a really good one. Uh, O'Malley has very good striking, but but you also can't you can't underestimate Sterling striking either. Sterling is on a nine fight win streak at this point, so it has to be taken into account that Sterling can keep up with the best strikers in the world so far in his weight class. It has to be taken into account. O'Malley doesn't have this huge advantage that everybody thinks he has in the striking. It, it's just a pattern of people doubting Aljamain. And and right there, I want to insert myself into that right to the, into that discussion. Aljamain, I DM'd you, bro. Dolo Ren, I DM'd you, man. Like, I told you. I, I was trying to hype you up for the fight. I told you I believed in you, bro. You, I'm, I'm still waiting for a reply, bro. I'm still waiting for a reply. You can't do me like that. You know, hometown booed you, bro, but I was rooting for you. So, you know, you got to show me some love, bro. I'm just saying, bro. Either way, uh, I got Sterling winning that one, too. I, I got Sterling winning that fight, too. But it's, you know, we'll talk more in depth in that in the future. But I do got Sterling winning that uh, as I think of it right now, just based off of, you know, what he can do in jiu-jitsu and wrestling and yada, yada. As far as the ground control, I got Sterling winning that fight. Uh, you know, he already beat Sanhagen. He already beat Corey Sanhagen. So, you know, there's no point really in thinking of that. Corey Sanhagen will have to prove himself again, which is why I believe Sanhagen and Devalashvili, Marab Devalashvili, should be for the winner of Aljo and O'Malley. That's what I think should be the course of action for Corey Sanhagen. I think that would be a really good fight. We'll talk that in depth at a later point if that does happen. I don't want to talk too much hypothetical fights. I, I would I would give you my opinion on it, but, you know, but I would rather just wait and see. Uh, but I, there's rumors that Aljamain Sterling will move up if he does beat Sean O'Malley. He'll move up a weight class and, you know, he'll drop the title and then them guys will, will scramble and fight each other for the title. So that'll be cool to see. You know, it's still an exciting division regardless. And I know Henry Cejudo wants Marab. I know he wants the number one ranked contender. But we should probably bring it down a notch for you, Henry. Henry, I just, you did amazing. 
but you just maybe you should bring it down a notch. Maybe you should try to fight Piotr Jan. You know, I think that's a good fight to make. Uh, I believe Henry Cejudo and Peter Jan should be a fight to make as well. Um, it gives Peter Jan a chance at a very good comeback with a good win on his resume. And it gives uh, Henry Cejudo a chance to bounce back from a close fight and, you know, maybe get a good victory himself and, you know, maybe keep going up. Maybe he fights Corey Sanhagen after that and then, boom, he gets the title shot again. Who knows? If Aljamain Sterling beats O'Malley, then the belt's up in the air. Anyone could get it. It'd probably be Henry's for the taking. Never know. But, yeah. Got that one out the way. Now, let's talk about Bilal Muhammad versus Gilbert Burns. Now, I told y'all about this one, too. I told y'all Gilbert Burns was coming in a little bit too soon. Now, he looked good in the fight. He did look good moving around. He still looked fresh. He still was popping that jab, coming in, you know, aggressively and fast, how he usually does. Um, but you couldn't really see too much of the calculated striking and strategy execution that you usually see from him not just because of the um shoulder injury when he went for the takedown but also Bilal, Bilal Muhammad you know his ring movement his ring movement was really good in this fight you know just constantly moving left to right you know settling sitting on some punches moving forward with some punches then moving to the right and moving to the left circling you know half circling circling around those are the kind of movements that get your opponent off kilter already. And it really wasn't a bad strategy. It really did help Bilal. And, you know, another thing with Bilal is, is he's strong, man. He's got a good chin. Uh, he's good with the sprawls. You know, he's, he's not the most technical striker, but the striking is effective. When it's coming forward with that kind of pressure, it's effective. And he's been proving himself to be a winner. So at this point, this is another guy that people underestimated too. At this point, you might have to stop underestimating him. Because, you know, he came into the, you know, yes, Gilbert Burns did have a shoulder injury. But Bilal Muhammad came in with an ankle injury as well. And you would have never really noticed it. Until they started showing the pictures after and before. You would have never really noticed. You know, he was throwing those kicks like, you know. He was whipping those kicks out, those high kicks, and, you know, hitting uh, hitting burns and arms and, you know, in the body. It was, it was good work, and you, you, you would never have even known he was injured. But regardless, both guys took it on short notice, and now we, now we know Bilal was injured before, and maybe Gilbert Burns maybe had somewhat of a shoulder injury prior. Who knows? But that's what happens when you go from one fight to another. These big profile fights from, from one to another in such a short amount of time, in less than a month, bro. Come on now, you can't do that. You got to give your body a chance to, to rest, to to heal up. Those muscle tears, you know, those ligaments, they got to heal up. You know, the, the muscle, all, all of that, bro. So that's just uh, that's something I was able to see before this fight even happened, that that was going to be tough for them. Now, hopefully in the future, hopefully in the future we get a good, a good, a good rematch between these guys. But, uh, for now, for now we just got to give kudos to, you know, them stepping up. Now, I believe, now I won't go too in depth in these either. And if the time ever comes that these fights are made, we could talk about them again. But uh, I believe that they should have uh, Bilal Muhammad versus Rachmanov next. You know, Rachmanov is one of those guys that's coming up in the rankings. And since, you know, you just got it, you, you, you got a you got a victory over Gilbert Burns, which was a very good opponent to have. But due to the circumstances, it wasn't the biggest challenge. On your part, yes, you had obstacles, but Gilbert Burns didn't come in 100% either. So, to get, like, a, a decent win, a better win, probably maybe you should give him Rachmanov. Maybe you should give him Rachmanov. 
because uh, we still got we got Leon Edwards fighting Colby Covington anyway, and we'll talk about that fight very soon, um, in the future. But uh, yeah, I believe Bilal Muhammad should fight um, Shavkat Rachmanov. I, I believe that's his name. And apologies if I said it wrong, but Rachmanov is definitely the last name at least. So boom, I believe that should be next for Bilal. Keep proving himself and prove to the fans that he wins, that that he should win a shot at the title. And Gilbert Burns should, even though he's you know he's 36, 37 in that age range, he's older. He's he's definitely getting older. And the reality is, if you don't got a title yet, then you know regardless you're old. But you don't be you don't want to be old and tired. You might as well just go take a year off, bro. You know, heal up, take some time to not even necessarily work on anything. Just, you know, heal up and keep doing what you've been doing. You you, you have great game plan execution. You have great skills. You have a lot that you offer to that, to that division. So I'd say take a year off and see what the rankings look like when you come off, you know, in a year. When you, when you come back in a year, I mean to say. Now, other than that, other than that, I believe Kamaru Usman should fight Kamzat next. If you know, just so you know, to get that division going, you know, it's, imagine that we have these fights like Rachmanov, Muhammad, Leon versus Colby, Kamaru Usman versus Kamzat. Now, say Conor McGregor wants to try, you know, try his try his luck at the division. See how that goes, you know. It's it'll be interesting to see. It'll be very interesting to see. It's a, it's a hot division right now, but uh, I believe that should be the next course of action for that. And finally, we're going to the Yan Jianan versus Jessica Andrade fight. Now this was a immediate knockout, an immediate knockout, and. This was kind of plain to see, you know, Jessica Andrade comes in with her usual aggression, usual way of entering into her striking. Uh, well, I don't know how to say it. The, the way she enters into, you know, her strikes is very aggressive and just with a lot of forward pressure. Now, that worked against her here. You know, she, she came out the she came out like she usually does, like a bat out of hell. Now with Yan Jianan, that's a, that's a it's a trained assassin right there. That's a it's a cold blooded killer right there. She was able to see what was going on with that range that she keeps, and that distance that she keeps. Along with that patience, she was able to you know she was able to see that Andrade was coming forward with three lead hands, and, and in the last exchange that it, it happened pretty quick either way, but um all in the first round. I, I, the exchange that got Andrade knocked out was a uh, Andrade was a uh, throwing three lead strikes like like a jab, a lead hook, and it looks like an uppercut or hook or something for that third punch. Now the thing is, Yan Jianan was able to see that, was able to back up, was able to calculate her punches, her counter, and. She she did an inside slip on that on that third lead hand, came over with a right hand and boom, good night. It was over for Andrade. I mean, no disrespect either. Jessica Andrade is is an OG, one of the best that's ever done it in women's in women's MMA. Period. If you've seen the last episode, you'd see all the stats that I gave up about her. You know her being able to have three knockouts in three weight divisions. And all her other com accomplishments, her record, how long she's been here, her ranking on the pound for pound rankings, her place on that rankings. It's she's a hell of a fighter and has had a hell of a history. And now Yan Janan is able was able to prove herself against a big name against her. This is big for Yan Janan, you know. Congrats to her. Congrats to that really good win. That was the first one on my on my parlay that I saw go go good. I'm like, oh yeah, this is. It's gonna be a good night. So Yan Janan, thank you, thank you for for the performance. Thank you for for what you do, and thank you for helping my parlay be successful. You're a hell of a fighter. And 
it was it was cool to see. It was a great win. Now, I feel like with this win, knowing Dana White, he's probably gonna just bump her straight up to like a title shot for this. And and if that's the case, then then you might as well just uh you know might as well just make it happen. Whatever. Like it's is it was a really good knockout. So it's you know she's red hot right now. Uh, you might as well make that fight. You know make some make some excitement happen in that division. And have her fight uh for the title. Now will she win? I'm not sure. I. I believe Alex Grasso has the title. If I'm not, if I'm, if I am correct, yeah, Alex Grasso has that title. So should I have to fight her, and we'll talk about that fight in the future. But uh, I feel like she one fighter she should definitely uh that she should definitely avoid if she doesn't get the title shot. Should probably avoid Talia Santos. Um, just with the fight that she had with Valentina Shevchenko, even though she lost a split decision, just her just her ability to her ability to control a good striker in Valentina Shevchenko, her ability to keep that ground control on her for so long, even if even if not much was happening other than that, it still got her a split decision. You know, it still went to a split decision, so. It could be tough for Yan Zhaonan that might not have that kind of explosiveness to kind of get past that. And maybe has the experience to work with it, but, like, not really excel and get over that, that hump of what she offers as far as what Talia Santos brings to the table. Might want to avoid that fight. But, um... But, yeah, but that would honestly be the best. That's how it should normally go. Like, or, I mean, it could be Grasso fighting Talia Santos, too. That could happen, but, but, uh, saying that scenario that Jan, Jan Janan fights Santos, whoever wins that should fight Shevchenko, and then fight whoever wins that fights for the belt. But, you know, that's how it would normally go. Now, um, I don't even see Jan Janan beating Grasso either, to be honest with you. But we'll get to that in the future. Uh, as far as Andraj, as far as Andraj, she should, she should also, she should take a little bit more time off the game. This would be a good time to retire. This wouldn't even be a bad time to retire. She might, you know, it seems like she was having trouble at flyweight and came back to this weight class at, to try to find some success, but uh, didn't really go her way. I'm sorry, was it flyweight or featherweight? Either way, um, if she's gonna stay in the game, she should stay at straw weight at the weight she just fought at. Maybe fight someone in the lower rankings, you know, to get her back in the winning column. But if you ask me, I would tell her, you know. Maybe make one more shot at it, you know. Maybe make one more run for the title. If it doesn't go your way, call it a day. You you don't have nothing to prove in the game. You've had great wins over Rose Namahunas. You've had great fights. It, it it's just it, you're you're decorated. You you've been a champion before. There's so much that you've done in the game. You don't necessarily need to keep going. But if you do decide to keep going, you should stay at straw weight. Um, I believe you should take a year off as well, a year or two off, just like Dur just like Gilbert Burns, and and get right and figure out you know what exactly you want for yourself because that's what matters at the end of the day. Nobody wants to see you get hurt. You know we all see you as a legend and we all love and appreciate everything you've done for the sport. So thank you, Jessica Andrade. Andraj, I'm sorry. And thank you, Yan Janan, for the great fight. And it's, and it's amazing to see a woman's fight with two people from two different countries speaking different languages coming together to give us entertainment. So as on my behalf, for the fans, 
and from the fans. Thank you. And most importantly, thank you for helping my parlay be successful because we got some money that day, baby. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay, so that was a breakdown, the post-reaction. That was a post-reaction to UFC 288, that the top three fights. We didn't cover the Kron Gracie fight, even though he lost pretty badly. You know, so kudos to everybody that fought in the UFC 288. Even the undercard fighters. Like I said, in the future, we'll cover more undercard fights. But we we'll definitely want to laser focus right now on the big ones. And give you the best analysis. And, you know, help help your parlays out maybe, you know. I'm 3 for 3 right now. Your boy is 3 for 3 right now, man. So, thank you for listening. Uh, stay tuned for more MMA coverage in, in future episodes. And, yeah, subscribe to the Instagram, the TikTok, the Productive Conversations, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter. Follow us everywhere. Subscribe on YouTube to Productive Conversations Podcast. You know, subscribe, listen to us on Apple and Spotify. We're on basically all streaming platforms. So you could, you know, you'll, you'll be hearing more MMA coverage. You can catch us anywhere. So just stay tuned. We'll keep you updated, and we'll keep you going with the MMA news. This is your man, Dolo Ren. Shout out Matt Brown. Shout out to the NBA crew, the NFL crew, the college ball crew, to everybody on the show, and that's helped the show. And I guess we can call it right there. Thank you for tuning in. Woo, let me say that again. Thank you for tuning in. And we hope to see you guys again. We hope to have you come visit and listen and keep coming back. We love the audience. We love the fans. And if there's anything you guys want to say to us, you know, you can always DM DM us. You can always catch us on the Instagram page, the Facebook page. And feel free to comment. We love to talk back. We love to have some banter back and forth. So, you know, we're talking sports. It's kind of how it is. So. Peace out. It's been Dolo Ren. It's been a pleasure. See you on the next one.